God damn it. Hell damn ass. I could really go for a Mountain Dew Kickstart orange citrus, but these supply chain issues have been the worst. Why can't Boss Man Brandon ship some happy drink in from Europe? Parapug, I know I programmed you to detect the paranormal, which, by the way, you've been killing it lately. The amount of orbs you've been spotting on the front door cam, the dusty one I've neglected to clean, very impressive. But could you check Amazon again? Monster Energy Orange Sunrise can only satiate me for so long. Scanning. Search query. Mountain Dew Kickstar. What's this? What are you doing? Are you playing an ad? Stop it! Initiate ad block. Ad block initiated. Jesus, that was close. Ad blocker 0451 brought to you by our sponsor, Diablo Immortal. Hey, are you a complete idiot that doesn't want your Alright, you know what? That's fine. Shut it down. It looks like our government is finally doing something worthwhile. What's up, Goth Gamer Nation? Did you know that Area 51 is an action horror first person shooter, all your friends are killed horrendously simulator? And it was developed by Midway Studios Austin and published by Midway Games in 2005 for PC, PS2, and Xbox, with a GameCube port announced and simply never spoken of again. The short lived Midway Studios Austin began life as Inevitable Entertainment, mainly composed of ex acclaim staff that had worked on the Turok franchise. Under this name, they put out two titles, The Mobility Shooter, Tribe's Aerial Assault, and an adaptation of The Hobbit. During Midway's attempt to strengthen their development wing, Inevitable Entertainment would be bought out along with Surreal Software, the creators of The Suffering and Drakkar games. The newly dubbed Midway Studios Austin would be put to work on Area 51 and its sequel Area 51 Black Sight in the publisher's attempt to remain a relevant force in modern gaming by Osmosis, a retro parasite clinging to to the tongue of the modern gamer. Area 51, as a video game, I suppose, began life in 1995 with Atari's arcade cabinet game, Area 51, a simple light gun shooter with digitized video sprite characters. This was a decent hit for then struggling Atari and began a chain of these types of games in hopes of keeping the momentum going. Any arcade or pizza joint or laundromat worth visiting had some game like this where a bunch of goofy digitized actors popped out from behind cover to shoot at you, only to be mowed down by your plastic pistol, blinking out of existence and quickly replaced by another. There was even a sequel to Area 51 in 1998 called Site 4 that didn't get ported over to home consoles like its predecessor. This is likely because home consoles were becoming more commonplace and arcade games as a whole were rapidly becoming no longer profitable, leading to Midway, which held the rights to Atari's games through a convoluted series of mergers and acquisitions, discontinuing use of the Atari name and working to reboot their franchises for sixth generation consoles. In interviews with the dev team, they admit to not entirely wanting to reinvent the wheel as far as shooters go, but seeing the success of games like Halo and Half-Life thought the first person shooter genre would allow them to build and grow the Area 51 universe, a world with ever deepening layers of conspiracy and military secrets. Everything was fair game, everything was canon, from the faked moon landing to the JFK assassination to Atlanta. Atlantis, we're going there and we're filling whoever's there full of lead. Originally meant to be in production for 18 months, it wound up taking three years, most of which was spent creating their own in-house engine. During this time, the scope of the game became too much for the team to handle, so much of their plans for Area 51 had to be pared down to produce a game they could realistically launch this decade. These plans included a greatly expanded alien mutation mechanic, where the player could experience 12 stages of mutation, trading certain abilities at the expense of crippling others. This was abandoned because of how much trouble they had balancing so many options, but so were many things as a result of their overambition and lack of leadership. Experiencing just about all the pitfalls a studio faces when trying to break into the AAA space, including crunch, mismanagement, and numerous redesigns. On release, Area 51 was met with a mixed bag of reviews, with many of the positive ones aimed at the PS2 version of the game, which makes sense because from day one, Area 51 was developed with the express intent of maximizing the console's capabilities, and the Xbox and PC ports came secondary and somewhat late into production. Concerning 
Concerning the PC version, however, IGN would write, From its chaotic beginning to its clinically insane conclusion, Area 51 provides just enough classic FPS action and technical goodness to merit a great rating and honest recommendation. On the opposite end, Edge Magazine would, like many publications, begrudgingly admit that it was fun despite being noticeably generic in the face of the rapidly progressing shooter genre, writing, Area 51 is entirely without inspiration, an exercise in slick, crowd-pleasing, cookie-cutter cliché from the Jerry Bruckheimer School of Entertainment manufacture. It is absolutely not bad, almost never broken, and usually a good deal of fun. Like a lot of games in the early 2000s, Area 51 had its film rights sold well before the game was even out, something that, when I was younger, I believed was some magical indication that the game must be good. They must know they have gold on their hands if Hollywood studios are interested. They even tapped comic writer Grant Morrison to come up with a script for it. I know them. I've heard that name before. They wrote for the new X-Men. That definitely sounds like a thing that would be allowed to happen. I'm me. I'm 14 years old. I'm a fucking idiot. Uh, update from the future of 2022. We did not get that Area 51 movie, but that's not to say Area 51 didn't wind up on the silver screen. It's actually featured prominently in the final scene of one of my favorite films. Stay Alive. Probably the only movie that's ever got. Just got. Gamers. You know, anyone who says size doesn't matter never played a third person shooter. You're a whore. <laughs> what is that? The f does that mean? Anybody that says size doesn't matter has never played a third person shooter. I in the end of this film, there's a shot of a video game store that may well just have been a functioning game store. Uh, everything in it looks appropriate enough, with the exception of a row of prominently displayed Sega Dreamcast consoles and a, a number of in-focus third-party Dreamcast controllers a full five years after the console was discontinued. Would they still be displayed like this, or would they be in some kind of bargain bin? Who's to say? It's a dense motion picture with lots to mull over. Like, why? anyone agreed to make it. Well, this video game business sounds like bullshit. After Area 51's sequel in 2008, and despite claims otherwise, Midway Austin had accrued a loss of something in the area of $34 million, and were scrambling to stay afloat, laying off staff and cancelling a game in production called Career Criminal. The current vice president of Microsoft Game Studios, but then CEO of Midway Austin, Matt Booty, would publicly announce that despite these developments, the studio would not be shutting down. Hey, you know what? Why why don't you and the boys take the week off? You've earned it. I mean, when you think about it, haven't we made enough games? <laughs> of course I'm kidding. What? That noise? I, w I was just sitting by the fireplace. That's right, I, I had one put in. Can you see it? You know, I don't know if you're ready for that. A year after, their parent company, Midway Proper, would file for bankruptcy and begin liquidating their assets, fully intending to sell off some IP and some buildings to sustain life just a little longer. Nobody other than Warner Brothers expressed any interest in the company, which owned franchises like Mortal Kombat and Gauntlet. So with no one else eager to get their hands on that IP, Midway accepted the Warner Brothers offer of $33 million for nearly everything. As far as I know, for whatever reason, the IP held by Midway Austin wasn't even sold off. It simply fell beneath the cracks. Even more strange, the PC versions of Area 51, The Suffering Ties That Bind, and another Midway published game, Rise and Fall Civilizations at War, were simply put up online for free as part of a sponsorship with the United States Air Force. I couldn't tell you how that came to be exactly. Could be that as Midway Austin was dying, they made an impulsive deal to get a little cash before the roof caved in, and given the US military's penchant for recruiting gamers, figured one game about the network of lies and atrocities the US government is capable of puppeteering, one that allows you to actively have a hand in brutal imperialism, and one about America's barbaric prison system and lack of mental health support was the perfect honeypot. I should mention the version featured in this video is not the one initially made available on the Air Force's website. That is now a dead link. But since then, two substantial fan efforts were made to keep Area 51 optimized and playable on modern PCs. The most recent being one made available near the end of 2021, which sought to preserve the vanilla experience as much as possible, the creator being similarly taken by the strange allure of the game. A big budget AAA title with a Hollywood voice cast discarded without a home. A cast that included X-Files star David Duchovny, Deadwood star Powers Booth, and... 
And you know what? That's it. I don't know about you, but I grew up fascinated by Area 51. Dreamland. Groom Lake. The place what got them UFOs, I reckon. A fascination no doubt exacerbated by media like X-Files and innumerable documentaries and books ruminating on the function and contents of this notorious top-secret facility. One that the CIA didn't even acknowledge as existing until 2013. I've lived through decades of drip-fed information concerning this one fucking building. Every couple years, some dying old guy comes out as the brother's cousin, sister's friend's former roommate of a janitor that interned at Area 51 and saw some vague thing, some tantalizing hint at the activities within. Anything from a glimpse at an experimental stealth aircraft to the military was in there cloning aliens and then I saw one of the aliens and then the alien looked at me. Gone are the days of star and of shooting an endless assembly line of jumpsuit clad green guys. 2005's Area 51 takes the bare bones of the concept and colors it with hard sci-fi schlock. In the deepest bowels of the shadowy Area 51 facility, a man in a mechanized wheelchair laments the loss of some kind of progress or something, proper vague movie trailer shit, before apparently releasing some kind of creature out of a space age storage tube. Hazmat Team Delta shows up to deal with it, but is quickly overwhelmed with several of them dying and the rest running off deeper into the facility. Some of the dead apparently reanimating with green alien eyes. We are then introduced to our protagonist, Hazmat Specialist, Ethan Cole, member of Hazmat Team Bravo, tasked with completing Delta's mission and rescuing what remains of them. He and the rest of Team Bravo suit up in their futuristic military hazmat suits and are briefed on the situation. Up top, a compromised agent has sabotaged a bunch of equipment in the base's hangar, so Cole is tasked with hunting them down first. After a firefight with this agent, their dead body sort of evaporates, leaving behind a puddle of glowing goo, and leading to one of your squad mates saying something cliche like, huh, that's gonna leave a mark. Bravo team is then sent down into the base, quickly exposed to a number of military secrets, with now mundane things like spy planes, only the tip of the iceberg. Down below, the staff of Area 51 are scrambling to recover after the release of an alien virus. Once infected, you lose humanity, becoming a puppet to some malevolent alien hive mind. Bravo team is attacked by waves of these alien mutants, forcing them to mow down dozens of once soldiers and once scientists. There doesn't seem to be anyone left to save. Anyone they meet who's still alive only remains that way for seconds before turning inside out like a meat sock. <laughs> Me when I make people watch The X-Files. <laughs> Did you know that Chris Carter wanted to end, end the series, series after season five but the network wanted? <laughs> The team attempts to make their way through the chaos, accomplishing all manner of video game objectives, like getting power generators back online, turning elevators on, activating an internet connection to download some data, and so forth. Things that are in every game that you never think about or remember. Area 51 seems like a game that had a lot of thought put into its story, and almost none of that wound up on the disc. Because really, there is very little to retain past a revolving door of radio voices yelling at you about a lever to pull or a button to press while an onslaught of mutants gun for you. But there are a ton of interesting things happening at the fringes that we don't get a clear answer for. From reading interviews with the dev team and watching the special features that come with the game, it seems like they are describing a totally different game. Some kind of thoughtful, slow burn conspiracy thriller, where a no-nonsense skeptic is forced to confront a world of secrets and lies, rattling his beliefs, turning his world upside down. One of many things that cancels that out is the fact that Ethan Cole very rarely speaks in-game. Aside from maybe one or two instances, he is your classic silent avatar. But in between levels, he narrates his experiences in the preceding level and musings about what lies ahead. While it is nice to check in with David and listen to him mumble about aliens and government conspiracies, it does highlight the almost improvisational air to this game's plot. This is a game that ain't exactly about solid story structure. It just kind of goes, and things happen while everyone shouts military jargon at each other, and eventually your squad mates start getting picked off one by one, and we have to cut back to David intermittently saying, He was dead. They were all dead. Crispy was dead. 
Crunchy was dead, Snap was dead, along with his brothers Crackle and Pop. The first of the crew to die is McCann. His head is just kinda unceremoniously popped off by a mutant that grabbed him off screen. I found it interesting that on one hand, this meant nothing to me. Years of video game violence has desensitized me to death, separated me irreparably from the carnage I inflict, and deadened my empathy. Just the type the Air Force was hoping to snag by making this game free, I imagine. On the other hand, I did at least know his name and the other members of Bravo Team seem pretty upset about it. They're all well-voiced, and you get a sense for the severity when they immediately ask to be pulled out. The death of one of them was enough for them to just pack it in and regroup. Of course, their path back is overrun, and they're stuck there, leaving the only option to push forward. It's almost like the paper-thin story is being uplifted by the cinematic quality of the game's production. The visceral nature of it makes me forget that I'm almost always not entirely certain what we're doing. It makes me think that the gameplay could so easily have lulled me into a highly suggestive state, where they could have had a bad guy take over my radio and tell me to press a button that would destroy a single school bus, and I'd just be like, huh? Oh yeah, sure, whatever, let's go. Again, I'm assuming this is why the Air Force suddenly became interested in gaming. I think whatever plans they had to discard are further hinted at with the scanner device that Cole collects early on. Presumably meant as some kind of compromise, a way to include story beats cut from the base game, they allow you to scan items littered all over that unlock videos and lore that is not insignificant. A large part of the mythos at play is relegated to these unlockables that you might not even find but that you also can't look at immediately after picking them up. You have to exit your game, hopefully just after a checkpoint, and return to the main menu to parse through these, and I think the entire meaning of this story and its overall tone would be hugely different if you just immediately had access to these. In any case, in trying to recount this game's story, I realized I was just kind of fast-forwarding through hours of me shooting guys until we actually get to a plot point, so I feel like we're gonna get there quick and, uh, Hey, you know what? If you have no interest in hearing how the rest of the plot plays out or you'd like to experience it on your own, then feel free to skip to this time to avoid potential spoilers. If not, feel free to stay right where you are, and if you're going to sleep and you've just left this on, I hope you have a pleasant journey to sleepy town unobstructed by unpleasant dreams or massive, massive centipedes. Why do I mention those? No reason. <laughs> I don't know if that, uh, if, if I was able to recreate the Doppler effect there accurately. <laughs> what are you doing? You guys hear that? Like, the amount of times I don't know what you're doing is becoming concerning. And f frankly, it's downright uncanny. Now you've got nothing to say? Interference detected. Hey, what's up? It's your little boy, Chad. Must you hack Parapug just to call me? Sorry. Force of habit. Can't you just... You call me on the, like the Discord or something. You're in the internet. You've got options. I feel like you're gonna fry this little fucker one of these days. My bad. Hey, I thought I heard you say Area 51. Yeah. Do you know something about it? I know a thing or two about Area 51. Really? Do you think you could hack into their systems and take a little sneaky peek at what they get up to? In other words, you want me to blow the facility up? No, no, that's actually not what I said. Nothing we can't handle with a few EMP grenades. Chad, I think you're misunderstanding me. Yeah? Yeah, I'm just trying to see what they know about extraterrestrials, UFOs, and whatnot. You mean space aliens? Well, it sounds silly when you say it like that, but pretty much. I don't know. Now I'm second-guessing everything. Maybe I should just nuke this whole plan. The only place it's getting nuked is Area 51. I'm on my way to the silo right now. <sighs> God damn it. I feel like he just really wanted to do that, and he wasn't actually listening to me. You back? Operational. I guess just keep an eye on the news? I may have fucked up somehow. While trying to link up with Delta, Cole gets separated from his two surviving teammates, Crispy and Ramirez, and they seem to be brutally attacked by some unseen force. Unable to reach them, Cole can only listen as his pals grunt out their final words. Sad as it is, it also shows how Cole's silent demeanor can come off as psychotic instead of collected and measured. His friend just wants to hear his voice one last time as the lights go out and he doesn't say a goddamn thing. Cool, man, I'm fucked.
fucking dying, man. What's that? It sounds like somebody's there, but I don't see anybody. Ah, uh, fuck. Huh, guess it's just a stupid <laughs> bug. Cool, I'm fucking dying, man. I don't know why Crispy is shaggy. Despite the narration stating that the virus takes four hours to mutate someone, Crispy manages to mutate in a matter of seconds, and Cole is forced to put him down. Before continuing the search for Delta, he attempts to report that his team was all dead but appears to be deep enough within the facility that his connection is lost. Thankfully, he's able to meet up with some of the Delta Team survivors, and they seem to have held out pretty well and are thankful to have more help as they've been attacked by some kind of creature. We help them blow open a wall to make a path back up to the surface, but it just makes an entryway for the creature they were talking about, so they do what any highly trained military death squad would do, walk up to it and shit talk it, call it an idiot, a fucker, before being swiftly killed by it. Man, you see this big fucking alien man? Oh no! I'm dead! I'm an idiot! All but one of Delta Team dies, and as Cole helps up the last remaining red shirt, he spies a group of even more teched out soldiers. They activate a series of explosives. They limp over to a massive elevator on the side of a launch tube of some kind. What's-His-Face almost has a moment of character depth before falling off the side of it as the bombs explode. Cole comes to with a mutant on top of him, and it bites him, infecting him with the alien virus. Unlike the others, he doesn't turn inside out and develop pointy teeth and vestigial tubes. He just kinda looks rough. Just then, a nearby corpse becomes animated in a green light and addresses Cole, telling him he has to find an anti-mutagen before falling limp once again. This is where Area 51 sort of just becomes a different game. Kept alive and lucid for some reason, he is able to use the strength and abilities of the mutants while following the voice that speaks to him through the dead. So we lost all of our side characters and the main objective is a bit of a wash, so we're just kinda starting fresh down here now. The voice leads Cole to Dr. Cray, the head of bioweapons down here in the sub 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 basement labs or whatever. There's a lot going on down here. The advanced military types, Illuminati soldiers, Dr. Cray calls them, seem to be cleaning up, taking out the regular scientist types, and destroying evidence of the pact they made with an alien race. Also, a group of pale clones discuss the potential success of using the alien virus on the surface, implying that the Theta aliens will spread the virus even after they've died. After preventing numerous catastrophe at the hands of the Illuminati, Cole finally comes face to face with Dr. Cray, who, in another fun idea, the details of which are handed off to the main menu reading materials, has cloned his lab assistant several times over to varying degrees of success. Much of his busy work is handled by Victor Five, who has one of the better walking animations I've seen. A main lab. Dr. Cray. We must hurry. <laughs> I like this guy. He's got a funny way of talking. After a pretty involved process, Dr. Cray is finally ready to give Cole his cure. But as they are preparing for it, the Illuminati rig up C4 at the fortified entrance to his lab, and one of the clones from earlier threatens to kill him for violating the pact. As Cole is receiving his cure, there is a power surge that halts the process and leaves him in his alien hybrid state. Just then, the C4 goes off, blasting Cray out of his chair and slamming against the decontamination chamber, killing him. Now you guys are fucked up. Actually, on second thought, I don't really have strong feelings about this situation either way. <laughs> The mysterious voice once again contacts Cole and instructs him to continue undoing what must be undone. The weapons lab is where another interesting thing happens, for me at least. I feel like at this point the story kind of slips through your fingers, clear goals like find Delta or cure yourself are gone, and there are only momentary objectives, short-lived moments of focus. But what they absolutely nail, especially for the mid-2000s, is fun set pieces. Once the game seems to pump all its energy into having fun with the idea of Area 51, using it as a fun house of creative sci-fi hijinks, instead of trying to smash its trope-ridden homunculus of a plot into a shape, it really starts to shine in an odd way. It's like it develops a new tone entirely. You use a UFO to blow up a nest of Illuminati soldiers, you hop along debris floating in some kind of anti-gravity field, there's a part with these powerful lasers that have gone haywire and are piercing through walls and ceilings 
things, and it sort of reaches its apex at the reveal of the soundstage where they faked the moon landing. Do I wish this was couched in a better narrative? Sure. But I think they knew that a lot of this was just fun enough for that to no longer matter. I'm sure they thought, hell, by now people don't even remember who Crispy and McCann were, or why we even set foot in Area 51 because this set piece kind of made the game. After a good while of this, Cole is finally able to meet the voice that's been communicating with him through corpses. He is a giant, disgusting, melted candle alien in a tube. Also, the actual character is an alien in a tube. Marilyn Manson is a creepy alien. The culmination of the elite's bioweapon testing. He and his kind were sacrificed in the production of the alien virus Cole has been infected with as a bioweapon. Part of a pact between humans and a race of alien greys, where we would help in the creation of this potentially world-destroying virus and in return receive their technological secrets. After Dr. Cray's son was murdered to keep the project a secret, and he learns that the Illuminati may be planning to use the virus on Earth, he released it within Area 51, in hopes of stamping out that possibility. Edgar instructs Cole to destroy a vessel full of the infected Theta aliens that is preparing to launch and wreak havoc on Earth, and gifts him with a vial of his blood, the use of which should, over time, return him to his human form. Ahead we see some of the many costs of humanity's pact with the Grey as the rank and file are sacrificed to them for their barbaric experiments. In essentially a massive alien cargo container, a flying saucer is being loaded with innumerable Theta aliens ready to lay waste to mankind. Cole destroys the core of this vehicle, which begins a chain reaction of destruction. He runs out of a Stargate, let's just call it what it is, okay, a Stargate TM, and is transported into the deserts surrounding Area 51. In the distance, the shadowy facility implodes, erased alongside all record of mankind's near destruction. Just then, some sequel bait drives by. Intentional or not, this truck does sort of bookend the whole story. The first thing Cole does when he arrives at Area 51 is protect just such a truck from being destroyed. And in the end, you see one just like it ominously drive by, perhaps suggesting that we haven't seen the last of this alien virus business. In an aerial shot, the landscape has been scorched with a network of alien symbols not unlike crop circles. We also get a cameo from the infamous Black Mailbox, which became a white mailbox but continues to be called the Black Mailbox, a known meeting place for alien enjoyers and likely a former mob dumping ground. In 2004, Midway released a demo for Area 51 that was included on a disc inside of an issue of the official Xbox magazine. The reaction to this demo was actually pretty critical. The main complaint seemed to be that the game simply didn't do anything new. 2003 through 2005 would produce many interesting and inventive first-person shooters, and Area 51 didn't seem to aspire to much else beyond fitting in. Even with Ion Storm alumni like Harvey Smith and Tom Hall contributing it was shaping up to be overall a bit generic. So in the year between this demo and the game's release, they did a substantial overhaul and redesign, doing everything they could to enhance the game before its second release window. I can't know what, if anything, changed about Area 51's plot in that year, but I'd imagine with how many times they had to start from scratch, redesign, restructure, it might have been hard to cling on to some semblance of a consistent and engaging narrative. Because it doesn't. It's hard for me to say something's not good, but this frankly isn't a very good story. Its relentless pacing does, I think, age it considerably. In 2005, it's still operating on these older shooter principles, assuming you don't want to take a beat to absorb what's happening. You don't want a break to cultivate some kind of atmosphere. You don't want a Black Mesa tram ride or the found footage seen in Halo, and would rather just be dropped in the middle of a firefight, in complete chaos where you can't get to know anybody, and even if you try to, they'll be dead within the same scene they are introduced. And you just stay there at the action peak with not but contextual cutscenes to interrupt your gunfire. And I'm just saying, for a game that quotes Satra at the end of it, there's very little philosophizing in the game, very little pondering of its themes. Even though you're actively sifting through all of the government's dirty secrets and your alliances are called into question, your beliefs and your faith left rattled, Cole seems pretty focused and dead set on just shooting everything. Despite the complete lack of anger in David Duchovny's performance, Cole is just angry at the alien enemies, but also the humans that allowed their plans to come together. It's kind of funny that it's in such 
stark contrast to Fox Mulder, the character that Midway, I'm assuming, wanted him to tap into for this game. But Mulder had much more complex emotions tied up with his belief and search for aliens. There was fear and wonder and personal trauma informing that. Cole, the same day he learns aliens are real, just wants them dead. They like talking with gestures. I'd like to talk to them with this cannon. Oh, don't get me wrong. If I was producing a video game and could tank the whole production just to have an X-Files actor in it, immediate yes, no question. I'd ruin my life for that. I'd ruin others' lives for that. I'd burn the world. It's still funny to me listening to the dev team try and rationalize his inclusion being for any other reason than someone higher up making a stream of consciousness decision. Uh, aliens, X-Files, David Duchovny, get his agent on the horn. This money's burning a hole in my pocket and I'm feeling invincible. Yeah, I think we're all familiar with his prior roles as kind of the person who wants to believe in the conspiracy theories and aliens. We really wanted David Duchovny just because, you know, the whole, you know, alien uh, conspiracy, that type of thing, the government conspiracy kind of really lended himself well to, uh, to David. I can't fault this logic. Plus, I mean, look at how he uses the controller. That's fucking adorable. This isn't like a hard line for me. I don't think just because its story is kind of bungled that it's ruined. There is a ton of fun environmental stuff that is almost heightened by the fact that you don't know what the fuck it is. I guess this extends to whole character and plot elements. There are a number of things that just kind of aren't relevant to the main objective and don't get a resolution hinting at a greater mythology at play. There's like a whole main character that exists only within the documents you pick up. I can see a concerted effort to build a lore to carve out a world. There were definitely plans to keep this rolling. I will concede that um, this may be me trying to make excuses for a game I had fun playing though, but uh, I feel like that's most of what I do. There's some quality to Area 51's gameplay that is hard to describe, and likely only perceptible to those with advanced gamer brain rot. It's like it's a shadow, a mimic of most first-person shooters I've played, picking up little bits and bobs of other games in an attempt to impersonate a AAA shooter. But there's something off about it. It's got a weird look in its eye, responds strangely to emotionally provocative questions. For the most part, everything that makes up a fun, if a little generic shooter, are here. You'll be surviving waves of mutants with the help of Delta Squad, getting in proper shootouts with Illuminati forces, manning turrets, climbing through vents, hitting levers, doing a little platforming. There are a couple of boss fights that are sort of repeats of the same one in slightly different variations. And at a certain point, you unlock mutant powers, which does drastically change how you approach certain fights. There's a decent variety of weapons, some of which you can dual weld, even though it's like the two most improbable ones. Cole's got fucking shoulders of steel, I tell you what. The game really wants you to dual weld too. Like if you're by another gun, he just picks it up and, and does it and you don't really have a say in the matter. You're still in that awkward middle ground between firing from the hip and looking down sights where you just kind of zoom in a bit, but given how frantic fights can be, there wouldn't be much call for anything else. The important part is all the weapons feel different from each other and feel impactful and responsive. When you quickly dispatch a large group of enemies while switching between weapons and mutant abilities, it feels really good. You feel unstoppable. It's the same way I feel when I accomplish any mundane adult activity that I imagine most people do without thinking. Cleaning your room, paying taxes, waking up. And this is far from the only game to do this, but can I just shout out games that have grenades that explode on impact? Yeah. Ugh. None of this throwing a grenade and it binks off the side of a dude's head and lands 20 yards away. I want to be rewarded for my impeccable aim that I don't have. Yeah! Yeah, let's go! <laughs> Your powers, I think, are very neat. This was a good idea to spice up the game, but I also think it's introduced kind of late in the game, and because of that contributes to how inconsistent it feels as a whole. I would often forget to use them because it wasn't introduced at the same time everything else was, so I kept re-realizing that I had cool alien powers. I'd get through a big shootout the hard way, and only as I'm picking up all the items left behind do I notice one of the glowing tubes of alien piss that you need to power your mutations, and I'd say a 
thing I've always said. Why didn't I just drink that alien piss? My life would have been so much better if I had done that. Being mutated gives you the passive ability of having enemies, even invisible ones, glow bright red. And you can hit them with an instant death melee attack, as well as a health draining parasite. You eventually get a hold of two alien weapons that are underutilized. I feel like the Halo sticky ball gun could have been a multi-purpose tool that is begging to be used for some kind of physics puzzle or something. That's like a whole game in itself right there, like a Cronenbergian peggle. It has infinite ammo that slowly refills over time, and you can also activate a ricochet aiming laser to perfectly determine where your explosive will bounce, at the price of the gun's power slowly diminishing while that's on. There are scant few moments of Area 51 that aren't a straight line, but it's good at blurring that fact by having you cross all manner of obstacles. It's not just a series of sterile hallways that you populate with dead. You're constantly walking on some kind of precarious catwalk, crossing makeshift bridges or using alien gravity trams. I'm just saying you're gonna be moving along several different vectors. I will admit it's got an inconsistent relationship with horror. It seems to be going for outright sci-fi horror in the first few areas. Pretty much all the time you spend with a team, they wisely find ways to separate you from them and make you crawl into some dark corner where a mutant can jump out at you. And there is something approximating stakes given that you're around characters that can be violently killed, and while they are more or less faceless, they do have names which evokes the faintest amount of my empathy. There's a fun atmosphere at play here where you have these tiny spooky moments in the midst of so much chaos. It's kinda tense. In the game's second half, however, which you go alone, instead of that making things more tense, they seem to firmly stick to action gameplay. That is when they give Cole superpowers and have him primarily fight Combine soldiers, essentially. Just dudes in the same high-tech armor. The game continues to be fun, it's mechanically very solid, it's just far less engaging outside some fun environments that intrigue me. I can't help but wonder if originally you were supposed to have a team with you the whole way and eventually it became a headache to keep up that pacing, so they just cut them out. Because Cole continues to talk about teammates that are already dead long after, and I guess you could read that as him coping, but the most memorable bits of the game for me are the ones where you have the banter and input from your team while you guys move from area to area and deal with new threats. Maybe if they stuck around longer, I would have felt their loss, and I would have better understood Cole's disassociated mumbling. It's weird. I'd played through this game once, likely as a rental, and for some reason I always remembered it being very difficult, especially in the last third or so. Having now played the PC port, I don't think the game is particularly difficult, but what could be a frustration is the checkpoint system it carries over from its console counterpart. It can feel like checkpoints are very precisely placed just beyond where they should be. What few times I died were accompanied by a classic, are you kidding me? This cannot be. I don't want to play this anymore. I don't want to make a video about this game. You can see how meaningful my word is, I guess. Let it not be said, I stick to my guns. Area 51 was released at a very strange time. I genuinely think that reaction to it might have been noticeably different, perhaps more forgiving, had it met its original release date. The reality that we got was a very nice looking PS2 game made for the PS2, released the same year that 7th generation consoles were beginning to come out. Something that means almost nothing to me, but sure meant a lot in the early to mid 2000s. I mean, if you look at how people hype up Unreal Engine 5, I guess it's proof that gamer chuds still put in absurd amount of importance on photorealism uh, in place of art style and design. Though I will say, from a design standpoint, Area 51 is a bit of a mixed bag. By the dev's own admission, they wanted the early areas to feel almost mundane in their realism. They wanted to make Area 51 feel like a real place with a believable layout that you could imagine people working a regular 9 to 5 at. The idea of incrementally making the facility more absurd and sci-fi is a lot of fun, but I think that kind of stock, stark concrete base aesthetic finds its way into most areas in the game. It's not all bad, it can just be a little repetitive visually in between the moments where it goes nuts with alien technology. Tubes with violet energy coursing through them, holographic readouts with wire grids and alien text. It's a lot of fun. Another thing I think they kinda nailed was their implementation of ragdoll physics. Not exactly the first game to use that technology, but it was still early 
enough that I was just delighted to see it in any form. It's not the weightless cartwheeling you'd see in Hitman or the boneless contorting in Thief Deadly Shadows, which are both beautiful in their own way. I don't fucking care, I just like seeing wiggly guys wiggling around. But in this game, enemies do seem to be sort of weighted appropriately at different points on their body, and the absurdity dial as far as how they react to gunfire is only slightly above real. It's just a shame that dead enemies pretty quickly disappear, denying you the privilege of surveying the death you've wrought. I want to feel like I'm perched atop a throne of human skulls in a, in, a, in a video game. At one point, I shot one of the clones without knowing that they were essentially just neutral NPCs, and I was taken aback by how sadly and realistically he just kind of dropped to his knees, mouth agape. Of course, mere seconds after noticing this, he just blinked out of existence. Yeah, so like a lot of things in this game, it's a bit of a give and take. Another thing contributing to this game's bloated budget was the hiring of Stan Winston Studios to design the game's enemies, a film special effects team. And hey, I don't know if these are actually what the team created for them, but I feel like they could, uh, you know, one more draft. One more draft. Not exactly inspired. I mean, the greys look good, but that's kind of an iconic design, you know? There's a reason they've haunted the minds of so many throughout history, and it ain't chompy teeth and claws. Looking at articles announcing this partnership in early 2004 sort of reveals how many changes the game went through. Some articles named the protagonist Lieutenant Nick Cross and claim you'd be able to swap between him and two other characters. Some say you'd have 15 different guns, and others say there would be DLC released for it. Some even mention Edgar being played by Trent Reznor and not Marilyn. There are quite a few things I never really thought about when I was younger, like so Cole's part of this top secret hazmat group sent into a hot zone, a place crawling with an alien virus. So he suits up in this futuristic outfit, but like doesn't put gloves on. He doesn't even have one of those mini bottles of hand sanny with the rubber loop on it. Okay, dude. Hey, how's he doing this? Just in general, what's happening? What is he doing to make this happen? What's he got that I don't know about? Even though I'm not a big fan of how Cole's hazmat scanner is implemented as a storytelling device, the visual of the little screen flipping out of your arm is great, and all the sounds it makes as it scans are really good quality beeps and boops. Not a scan of that body. No contact. Even in some of the more scathing reviews of Area 51, there's usually a tidbit complimenting this game's sound design. And I do think, in the context of this being a late PS2 game, late in the PS2's life and late to release, that it would for the time, probably sound great. Yeah, you know, if you had a expensive stereo system or some such thing. I think a lot of the game sounds for things like item pickups and whatnot might not be, but sound like they're from a stock library. But shootouts can sound pretty intense, and often what would alert me to nearby enemies was the sound of bullets smacking into a metal walkway or something. Certain areas, especially labs or ones that have some kind of machinery in them, work up a nice atmosphere with a mixture of buzzing and whirring and computer boops. Let's be real though, people weren't buying Area 51 for the bloops. They were buying it for the Hollywood voice cast. In the years after X-Files first ended, David Duchovny had a brief stint as a video game voice actor, appearing in not only this game, but the comic-inspired shooter 13, as well as an X-Files tie-in called Resist or Serve. And I got love for the guy. He's one half of the best show ever FUCKING made. Just hearing him, knowing he's there, guiding me through my gaming experience is in its own way a comfort. That said, David, baby. Just take a nap. It's okay. You've worked hard enough. You've earned it. Just rest your little peepers. Have a few honk shoes. It's gonna be all right. Come back to the shoot, energized, ready to go. I don't know who's more guilty for this carnage. The aliens or the humans who agreed to the pact in the first place. I've come too far to back down now. I don't even think he's putting in a bad performance, his energy is just way off. And knowing to some degree how a gig like this would work, he'd have a voice director with him, setting up the scenario and describing what the tone should be, and you know, saying, hey, maybe we take that one again, <laughs> or um, okay, that was good, maybe put a little bit more of this into it, a little more of that, uh, and for whatever reason, they just kept giving him ambient. Try one more, this time. Whereas, if I was acting and somebody tried to 
to direct me that specifically, I, I tell him to go, you know. <laughs> hey, you know what? You do you, King. All right, I've skirted around it long enough, but the other big name on this call sheet is one Brian Warner. And whatever this is. A musician of note and vocal fry aficionado who plays the alien that communicates with David Duchovny's character via dead bodies. As a 15-year-old, the combination of Mulder and Manson was impossible to stay away from. Obviously, with a number of allegations you can Google, this figure, who was once influential to me, different thoughts now come up when I hear his name. But also, there is the fact that He's not a good voice actor. Your flesh tears so easily. Your bones snap so quickly. It doesn't help that all the dialogue written for him sounds like literally I wrote it at the age of 15. I definitely scribbled some of this cringy edgelord bullshit in the margins of a school notebook. Lots of I despise humanity. They've made an unholy union that shall be punished forthright. Real retro school shooter vibes. Try pushing me into a locker now, Billy. And there are some some other noteworthy voice actors beneath the headliners here, Powers Booth, you know, sounds great as the commanding officer guy whose name I don't remember. It's a shame that this character is largely irrelevant for most of the game. They don't ask much of him other than, you know, shout kind of generic objectives into your radio, which I suppose he's good at. I want that elevator working. Pronto. Dr. Cray is played by Ian Abercrombie. They have become smarter than I thought. We should hurry then. A guy who had a long storied film career, but whom I only associate with Mr. Pitt from Seinfeld. Look at this, a spaceship. That is so cool. Where is it? <laughs> right here. I'm looking there. Outside of the film actors, Midway seemed to spare no expense hiring accomplished voice actors for even nameless roles, including half of Max Payne, James McCaffrey, who is credited as additional voices. It's also one of the earliest Nolan North appearances, right at the beginning of him just being in literally every game ever fucking made. All the smaller, incidental characters sound great, but there is so much importance put on two actors who, yes, have big names, but one is asleep and one is just not very good. Actually, if you play the 2004 demo. I don't know if the voice work in that version was placeholder or something, but it's noticeably not great. Not only the performance, but the production as well. They don't appear to be human. Requesting permission to return to insertion point and regroup. Your insertion point has been compromised. If there is no going back, you need to keep moving. Roger that, Command. Bravo, out. Actually, now that I think about it, there were moments in the finished game where two characters would be talking to each other at two, like, completely different energy levels. We've got to find our way through here. Can you show us the best way? The controls are upstairs! I, I swear, every time I think of something nice to say about this game, I reflexively try to criticize it. It's a fun game, but it also... You know... I, I stopped myself. I was almost going to do it again. <laughs> Going out on a positive note, however, Area 51's soundtrack is a lot of fun. It was composed by Chris Vrenna, a founding member of Nine Inch Nails and collaborator with many noteworthy bands uh, like Smashing Pumpkins and Rob Zombie. There was a while in the early to mid 2000s where he started to make a name for himself scoring video games. Uh, working on games like American McGee's Alice and Doom 3, but that seems to have petered out since he became a music instructor in 2018. In any case, this game has an enjoyable enough synth-driven soundtrack that is built out of these kind of layers of ambience that grow in intensity the further into a level you go, and the bigger the combat set piece becomes. So each area has a few variations of spacey ambience and more exciting themes with techno, industrial, and breakbeat elements worked in. This is definitely where it shines for me. There were several times when I was playing this that I was like, oh dang, I gotta look this up later. I gotta Shazam this and then it says Area 51 soundtrack and I'm like, oh yeah, I guess I knew that. Has Chad made the news yet? Scanning news. Interfered. Fuck. Well, I'm glad to hear you're still in one piece and that you didn't do anything crazy. Oh, trust me, that missile's on its way to Area 51. Oh, really? What does that mean? Doesn't something bad happen if that happens? If we destroy the Aquinas hub, we'll take down the global network. 
That sounds bad. Another Stone Age. Well, that's just great. Wait, you're on the global network. That means you'll die. Oh, right. Okay, I took care of the missile. Just like that? Where does it go now? Does it matter? Hey, I guess not. Hey, <laughs> out of sight, out of mind. <laughs> Urgent news detected. Huh? Extremely unfair. Very weak HP and armor and enemies shred you apart in seconds. Too much shooting. No bosses cause the endless enemies are bosses. Six guns or so doesn't make you stronger. Your monster form sucks. Like being the Hulk with no superpowers. I like picturing this dude just completely overwhelmed with the shooting cowering in fear they keep shooting me too much shooting i'm not gonna say get good but like you're not playing as john halo you're just some fucking guy a hazmat specialist i don't think that's even a thing well it could be i guess i don't know why i said that when you first get to area 51 someone says now i know you don't usually carry a gun and then hands you a gun and teaches you how to shoot it i feel like that would make you slightly more vulnerable to trained black ops illuminati clone psychos wish it would have come with some kind of manual. Get so far that I cannot get any further. Haven't even been able to shoot or kill aliens yet because I can't get to them. I'll figure it out sooner or later. I pack away the system. Try again later. Oh, I thought I gave up early. DM and this one person that found this helpful just packed up the console and let it collect dust. Another saved from the fate of a gamer. I am C. Jones. This review written by Plug my grandson. This game is really a good one. The players are awesome. I am at the Grays level, and it is an exciting game. I am also interested in other games like this, and books. I love books on the Titanic and Roswell. For I had an Uncle Phil, who was associated with the space program, and knew Werner von Braun. He never claimed to have seen a UFO, but my grandmother said no doubt he rode on them. For he was the great Thor chief. I am visiting Roswell with my godmother soon. Thanks for a great game. My name is Plug. I am his grandmother and I approve this message. After a little editing. Guys, I think an alien wrote this. I think this is literally an alien in a trench coat and I'm fucking scared. The best thing about this game is that it starts with the letter A. That way it's near the top of the list when you go to add remove programs to delete it. I wanted to give it at least two stars for effort, but I can't bring myself to do it. I'm not a big fan of first person shooter games anyway, but this one is pretty awful. The enemy's aim is near perfect and you can get shot hundreds of times. It's cheesy and boring. After going a long way through it, there is nothing at all that I can think of that makes this a fun game. The mutation stuff is stupid. The graphics are very good. The sound is fair. It's a very typical game. Reminds me a lot of Quake 4 as far as the movement, environment, and all that jazz goes. All in all, it's a sad, pathetic waste of time. Jesus, that opening zinger is so solid. Like, I'm not even gonna... I'm, I'm gonna let you have this one. Like, but also, why do you keep getting shot? Now, I don't like these shooter games, so naturally, I don't like how enemies are shooting at me and I'm shooting back. So, all in all, this is not a good game. I think it is a bad game. Weak and embarrassing, not up to par. The story is decent. The premise and setting is okay. But this game borders on unusable sometimes. There is no save system. Pathetic on a 2005 title. You can play 20 minutes looking for some bizarre thing that they hid in the game and get killed at the last minute. Another 20 minutes playing the same thing again. Ah, I thought we were past that years ago. F5 guys, F5. The embarrassing part is I see, I see myself in there like, I'm sure that's just how PC gamers sound. Then there's the controls. The book tells you very little about what to do in the game. I wandered around for six or seven sections of the game not knowing what to do with the damn scanner. Also, there seems to be a total lack of health when you need it most, and an abundance when you don't need it. Didn't the developers play this thing before they shipped it? Totally weird. And there were so many cutscenes and cinematics, it's hard to get into the rhythm. And then the most troubling thing. I love these FPS games. Far Cry, Doom 3, Half-Life 2, etc. Play them all. But Area 51, I find it very hard to see where I am. The action is pretty weird, which is okay. It is a fictional game after all. But because of how murky the controls are, and how 
wide the field of vision of the character is, I end up with a headache trying to see where I am half the time. It's hard to know where the shots are coming from and where the enemy is. It's hard to describe, but the field of vision is just lousy, and for a first person game, that, that's indeed bad. All in all, very disappointing, I can see why it didn't do that well. It's clunky, has poor playability, and it's hard to see what's going on. Too bad, actually. As the story is not that bad, David Duchovny, while bland as heck in this, at least is a real actor, and Area 51 is steeped in fantasy lore as a subject in general. All in all, a bargain bin special. I, I don't get this one at all. I think you may have eye problems? I mean, there's no shame in that. I wear comically thick glasses. I just... I don't think in a first person game, especially if you've played others with no issue, you should be saying things like, I can't see where I am. That's like, all you're seeing is where you are. It's first person. You shouldn't be seeing yourself. Does that make sense? The field of vision is eyesight. It's the same as yours. I am honestly concerned about you. Not just because you seem you know, so confused, but I'm scared that you're seeing things that aren't there. Seek help from a fucking manual. Good God. I'm only kidding. You don't have to get good. You could stay bad. In a world that was already playing the likes of Half-Life 2, Halo 2, Doom 3, Metroid Prime, out crept this oddball game that wasn't exactly clamoring to break new ground. Just set up a nice little plot of land for itself in a shooter landscape that was quickly swallowing up real estate. I think if Area 51 were to come out today in this exact form, and in an age with a proper indie game community, it could be seen as a quaint throwback to a specific period in gaming. A love letter to the shooter of the late 90s to early 2000s. But 2005 didn't have any time for that line of thinking. It's one of those games where you can feel its struggle to be born when you're playing it. It's haunted by its journey here. This can sometimes flavor a game, grant it some indescribable charm, but other times it can harm your impression of it and turn you off from playing it. I don't think there's a way I could describe my feelings about Area 51 that doesn't include conflicted or split. For every success it makes, there are two failures, and at the end of the day, it sort of balances out to be not amazing and not offensively bad. Having faint sparks of creativity and potential marred by a messy production cycle and maybe just tempered ambition. It seems like it was a big idea that was argued down to a small one, as resources were unwisely funneled to making an engine from scratch, making a multiplayer component, and stunt casting an actor tangentially related to the subject of aliens. But Area 51 is still a fun if slightly empty shooter, in that you may have to sift through some garbage before you find its heart. There is the novelty of playing a AAA game that was simply left stranded. It's like urban exploring an abandoned Kmart or something, and you're just like, wow, so nobody wanted any of this shit? It has enough going on to hold your attention. A charming, chunky aesthetic which renders some neat environments and some amusing physics and also has a great soundtrack. Just know that unless this is just 100% your vibe, your era, it's not gonna blow you away or anything, and it might just wind up boring you. In researching it, I saw a lot of videos, you know, long plays or just media concerning it, and many of the comments have some variation of, oh my god, when I was a kid, this was the scariest fucking shit in the world, I'm gonna piss myself if I look at it, oh my god. So I'm sure it reached a generation, and despite how much shit I talked about it, like, I too have a fond memory of it, a soft spot for it, which if you look at any of the videos in my channel, you should know that's not entirely a trustworthy endorsement. But also, if you don't like the game, fuck it's free, so if you don't like it, take it up with the manager. Nobody. Well, maybe the Air Force. Start asking questions. Thank you so much for watching my video. That is the end of it. Thank you very much for watching this far. It's okay if you skipped some of it. Totally understandable. Hey, maybe I could be a real YouTuber for a second and say like, Oh, what did you think about Area 51? Did you have a different opinion about it or some shit? Maybe you could put that in a comment. I don't know. That's just the thing I hear people do. But you know, if you like that video, I have other videos which I, I'll assume you know how to track down, but there are other things you could look up in the description of the video, like uh, my Twitter and my Discord and my Bandcamp and my uh, merchandise. You can get a, a case for your phone, that even if it's like 
several generations old like mine. This one only took like two months to get to me, but hey, you know? <laughs> Uh, special, extra special thanks actually, uh, to Ailing Uncle, to Password for Kids, again Dean, Alex, 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 Alex Raymond, Alexander Smith, Alexander Sundin, Andre Perkins, Aparts89, Bayard Brown, Ben Carnell, Bang Fleng, Benjamin Sid Perez, Big Abuela Energy, D Sky, Daphne Pittendry, Dark Raptor 86, Deluminati, Diesel Dizzle, Dr. Beard, Dos Days, Edgy, Edward Avila, Fart Mother, Game Master, Gamma, Garrett Gavinus, Gody McGork, J. Alameen, Joseph Zanon, Noni, Carrot, Kamikaze Melon, Leon Hooks, Lizatar, Marcus Chani, Mundane, Neck Out the Brave, Octo, Oisto, Philip Woolley, Richard Gillespie, Roland, Salvatore Tosti, Sammy! Shadow Man 13, Snapplefish, Stuka Bliat, This deal is getting better all the time. Unpopular opinion HP Lovecraft was a mediocre writer who struck gold in that he tapped into a zeitgeist in pulp in his time. Zach Bishop, Crash Punk, Daniel Streb, Avener, Giraffa, Catherine Graven, A Hanging Chad, Bing Monkeys and Bonkeys, Brady the Sanity Tax Collector, Rosuf Jones, Cantankerous, Donut Stalker, Dubs, High Food Court, Ishanji, Mad Monty 98, Morgan Dorian Trius, Nafiz Hook, Ophelia Fishwife, P Dizzle, Persian Air, Please stop treating player agency as a negative. Leaning left right manually isn't a fucking cover system, it's basic movement. Robert Brandon, Samuel Ward, Technica, that uninformed guy, the brunette girl from ABBA. Where am I help? 410 billion 757 million 800 164,530 gay cops. A guy in a jacket. Alistair Stewart. Alexander Ulbrick. Ali G. Andrew Hagstrom. Andrew Light. Andy Krieger. Atari Steed. Beetle Sky. Ben and Kara Dowling. Bishy98. Bobby Campbell. Brendan McFadden. Brett Weaver. Colby. Colt of Lita, Dan Cullen. David Frumke. David Harpstrite. Dazed Clockwork. Fix My Brain. Haley Bobella. Hitoshi-san. Jake Desi. Jake Raynor. June Choi. Jordan Balzano. Joshua David. J Raptor. Captain Ketchup. Kiki Dharma. Leopold Glue. M, Mandalore Gaming, Max Cohen, MCR, Micah J. Best, Miles Phillips, More Sharks, Mr. Ducky Quack, Mystical Lint, Name Requires DLC, Nick Hill, Nick Timmins, Nuclear Sun, Nunu, Oliver Marshall, Opichi Kostra, Paul Fierce, Robert, Ruibisomem, Samejima, Scarthorax, Lord of the Roaches, Scofflaw D, Skylar J. Leal, Saab Akaduka, Spooky, Startide, Swood Operator, Team R, Travis Houston, Vincent Cronin, Zanga PF, Zdenek Benez, Seven Hour Depression, Adam Page, Adrian, Alec Dye, Alexander McConnell, Anarchy Parrot, Andre Ferreira, Andre Kalganov, Anon, R Attack, Arshis Knight, Austin Scott, Barbecue Jr., Beardicus, Ben White, Benjamin Judah Phelps, Big Cheese 1000, Big Honk, Binary Vision, Bindle, Biddles 999999, Blotherus, Bloodclat Mentality, Boris Rombolt, Brendan Naftal, Bug Hall, Buckaroo, Byron Callan, Cabbage, Calavera, Callum May, Cannon Go Boom, Cat Hands, Casputin, Chow Horde, Charles Morgan, Chicken Lake, Jimmy Changa Jones, Chris Jordan, Chris Tallarico, Chunky Duncan, Clay Catlin Loves You, Colin Boyd, Commissar, Connor Sullivan, Crispy, Delamanek, Dan Richardson, Dante de Glanville, Dark Cloud 402, Darkov, David Quinn, David Offord, Dead Bodies Appear at My Lake, Declan J. Keen, Der Commissar, Devin Rampersad, Devin Gillespie, Dilda, DJ Necroman, Dreadhead, Drenched, Dry County Blues, Edward Crawford, El Jazguar, Elizabeth V. Haste, Ersandro, Yulino 7, Exit. JTR. Fazy. Fellas, don't drink that coffee. There was a putty in the percolator. Sorry. Fib Likely. Frodo Ballbag. Frederick. Gecko Jones. Ginevra. George. Greg Buchold. Greg McKee. Gray for life. Grimbeard is cute and strapping. Halcyonized Platypus. Ian Greer. Ian Laser. INTJ loves her INTP. Evo Zap. J Marshall. Jared Siri. J Dog 3433. Jean Philippe Malouin. Jessica. Jesse Randall. Jesse's Mommy Milkies. I'm sorry. That is the cost of it being alphabetical. Jim J, J Man, DX, Joe Face, Jojo Evans, Jordan, Wabuctus, Justin Stewart, Khalil Corey, Kevin O, Chris Odie, Lori Kubri, Lazar Nechekov, League of Struggle, Leland Miliokis, Leon Holmes, Lewis Gordon, LGX, LL0X, Lorelei, Lost Via Domus, Lucas Kettner, Major Millions, Mangy Mongrel, Matt F, Maximo Seven Labar, Megan Carmody, Murr, Michael Maines, Michael Pelican, 
Mike Garza, Mocha, Moonpix, Mr. Sark, Mr. Bujangles, Q-Champ, Nicholas Nelson, Noel M, Nuan Sonar, Oh Heck It's Noah, Olympus 3DX, Omar Eid, Otter Soldier, Pen Knight 89, Petrus Montanu, Pikati, Pizarro, Please Keep Making Videos, Professor Nowitz, Ronin, Rinkara, Robert Chernovsky, Sagasachis, Sam Gardner, Savvy Fave, Skas117, Scott Aldrich, Sean, Sean Clausen, Ziegent, Sleepy Poss, Smokey Jefferson, Spaceman Spiff, Spider, Splort Dusky, Seventh of His Name, Sugar Wolf, Steinuel, Steph Van Andel, Steve, Strakenia Redenkovich, Subdermal Cassette Loader, Sidney Steverson, T. Grimm, now random supernatural quote, random character. Sammy! <clears throat> I am Asmodeus. That was, of course, Asmodeus. Who'd you say you were? I am Asmodeus. Terranism, Tindalos, Titan, Toaster Ringtail, Totally Not a Mimic, Trenton Wilkins, Turbo Bra, Tyler F, Vargar, Vel, Ween Supreme, When Will Grim Review, All of Nancy Drew. Hey, you know what? I'll do it. All right. Wildo, Yak Spiker, Eves Yang, Zachariah I am, Zin, Zin, Zubertuber, Sinun He, AJ Leroy, AL Carpenter, A Bonkers Chicken, A Dolency, Adrian Fachi, Adventure Game Geek, Alexei German, Alex Hanna, Alexis Pinsonalt, Andy Starling, Anno, Anthony Daniel, Arachuary, Eris Alessandrakis, Austin Mathis, Autotroph, Baker, Bent Out of Shape, Big Hubert, Bo, Boop Butt, Brad, Brad Bones, Good for Brad, Brian Cole, Brian Sanson, Brick Dick Rick, BS Fam, B Southby, Cat Boots, Kaz, Kristen Danny Storgard, Christopher White Schneider, Clayton, CMG161, Corin Green, Creepy Lounge Lizard, Krylar, Dale Walden, David Moreau, Iowa City DSA.org, Help the Iowa Left, please, Dizzy Rogue, Dongs.exe, Dylan Clements, Dinah, Earth Go Hard, Elric, Fab Fabulous Freckles, Feeder Goldfish, Frank, Freaking Bamboozler, Gamercot, Gamesbrit, Gargantua, Gato Malo, Grimbeard Stole My Credit Card, I Am Sorry, Gusinder, Half Asian Viking, Halam, Harry Sykes, Hashi Singh, Helen, Herb Messiah, Hinches, Hiss, Homeboy Dirtbag, We Lay, Ignacio de Guglielmi, Isabella Stoner, Jacob Hanley, Jake Roper, James Sutherland, Jared, Jay Ack, Jed Grahek, Jeep Pete, Jesse Karczynski, Joe Reynolds, Joe Richardson, Johannes Preisa, John, Jonathan Becker, Josh B, Joshua McLarnin, Yoni Niamela, Yuha Kauri, Kakun, Karen Mayville, Kenopsia, Kevin Thurber, Krampic Newt, Laszlo, Lucas, Lucian Jelly, Level Zero, Matthias Waltman, Max Carlaftis, Melly, Me P Fair, Mr. Mundus, Mop, Mugwuffin, Yargar, Niall McCorkendale, Nicholas Monroe, Nun, Not a Door Person, OK Cat Dad, Oliver Darmody, Ombud, Ottavio Albanese, Party Over Here, PWs, Pedro Costum, Perennial Astronaut, Phony Soprano, Piotr Sankowski, Princess Flumpf, Professor Nex, Pixelfish, Rahul Kirthi, Rana Banana, Resurrection, Ricky Goss, Ricky Rigatoni, Rith, Roast Samson, Roses Are Red, Violets Are Blue, Tony Hawks, Pro Skater 2, Ryan Hollinger, Ryan McLeod, Sam C, Sam Myers, Samich, Saturn 999, Schluff, Schwabalaba, Sean Lees, Sean McDonald, Seaway Jerk, Sentient Turtle, Sean Rogers, Sean Tiva, Silvano Gonzalez, Sinan the Montoya, Slava Saknienko, Slavic Dreams, Smokey, Sneaky Beeping, Solar Box, Steven Laflame, Super Dunman, Sven Grell, Swedish Petish in the back seatish, Sinoi, Surprise, Tatami Guy, Tax Deductible, Test Done, The Gaming Beehive, Little Bee, The Real Kalel, The Magnificent Spud. There's no rule says a dog can't learn to use a computer and donate via Patreon. Thread, Tim Johnson, Val Halverson, Valinora, Varioth, Vinculus, Visitor Information, Warhopper, Whiskey Grenade, Your Patron, Yuko Valles, Zalbuk, ZJ, One Eyes low avatar work broke my gamer wrists and hippie heart adrian alberto ferreira valverde alex army bull alex spears alex yui allegory alpaca omega feeder of blood anna trans rights exo andre kurenkov andy f anna enough astro shepherd as roy bertigan basti benjamin payne bernard walker bertie bertig bertie big 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 farty nuts <laughs> Big Death Energy, Big Danger, Big Stupid Grin, Bloodworth, Bobson Jr., Boye, Bow to the Beard, Brand Faust, Brandon Harris, Brandon Shock, Bratishka, I Brought You Something to Eat, Brian Lucy, Cam, Camelopardis, Campbell Gilpin, Cassidy Moser, Chalabard, Chaz Holy Holies, Chef Toker, Chili Dish Gambino, Chonko Ronco, Chris, Chris Barb, Christy Mallory, Chunkus Manhunkus, Clinton Attaway, Cloister 56, Colton Rowe, Conrad Eastman, Cryptid John, Dalton McCabe, Danzinski, Dandy Alexander, Danny D, Daniel Ginn, 
Daniel Newberry, Daniel Panna, Dante K3, Daryl Lai, Dave Bojack, David Badzinski, David LaSalle, David Muziel, Dead Alewives, Delta, Damar, Desu, Display Name Here, Div, Devaith Faust, Domingo Carlo Martinez, Dust Sucker, Dylan Lash, Edmo Filo, Eggs McOmelet, Emmett Arthur, Epic Dude 467, Eric Leung, Eric Lawn, Erotic Fridge Magnet Poetry, Figley Berserker, Fitzgerald 93, Florian Vogel, Francisca Demetrovska, Frantic Atlantic, Freaky Demon, Fremantle, One Word, Franz, G Braiding, G's, Genuine Chillcast, Gianni Matrograno, Gideon Joubert, Graf Zal, Greyheart, Gribbly, Gerlin, Guy, HL Longboy, Hannes Jacoby, Hazel Connor, Hymo Statman, Hofflerand, Holy Mullet, Hush Vox. I confidently tell potential housemates that I paint Warhammer Orc Goths if I were to talk about the Saddle Creek sound game. Uh, ran out of letters, I guess. I fought down. Ian, Ian Baranek. I guess it's time. Impulse 101. Inside my strange place. Isaac, I love that guy. Jacob Gardner. Jade Partita. James Burton. JB. JCL 300. Jean Philippe Sima. Jick Magger. John Adams. John Araujo. John Brumley. John Kamich. John Stone. John Z. Joseph Paulos. Josh Hessler. Joshua Khan. Justavian. Justinus Smertinus. Khalifas. Karate Schnitzel. Carpad. Casey Gould. Keenan Smith. Kimia. Christian Benedback. Kirano. Kyle Williams. Lefazar. Laura Harwood. Lauren. Lauren Miller. Lee Stone. Leonardo Antonio Aquasanta. Louis Quinn Whalen. Liam. Low C. Lucas Mendel. Luke Gasway. Lynn Lovett. Madzi. Magno Dick. Manu Weidman. Mara Alina. Matt Clark. Matt Duman. Matt M. Matt Chester. Matthew Arrowwood. Maxim Sleepwalker. Mage Win. Metal Crew. Mia. Michael B. Michael Henderson. Miguel Amaro. Mike McMuscles. Mikey Tambourine. Mind Blaster. Mohammed Ali. Mojave Jade. Moral. Morgan Guinta. Morgan Harper. Mungo Jerry. Mustard Sweat. Mutism. Nathaniel Clark. Nathaniel Dolinchuk. Necronoxicon. Negative Creep. Nick Bowl. Nick Johnson. Octo. Uncle. Orlando Murillo. Pagan Butler. Peach. Peachy Pixel 8. Pentagon Black. Phoenix Flames. Frand. Pinky. Piotr Skubala. Piranot. Please stop calling me gay. Pommy. Popeye Bark. Prod Mage. Pugs Please. Quirky Top Hat. Rachel Rose. Raphael Becker. Rasmus Karras. Raul Vidal. Red. Red OKB. Reflect. Rayo Palmiste. Rayleigh. Replicant. Ruben. Robert McMahon. Robert Scotland. Roosevelt Huber IV. Rotten Avocado. Ryan Garvey. Ryan Malone. Sabwones. Saint. Sam. Samantha Wells. Sammy 3D. Samuel Albert Mel. Sarah Denman. Scott Valine. Sea Lever. Sean Bradford. Seth Flagg. Shazbot 101. Snaggy Ducks. Suck a death. Someone finally pays me. Space Lizard. Sparkle. Summerstorm. Sweeneasy. System 16. That one guy. That Taffer. The French Ghosty, The Sid 4, Thomas Finnegan, Thy Rourke, Timothy, Tony Brandt, Tony Gleed, Tristan Daniels, Soros, Tucker White, Tyler, Mindrup, Uncle Dozer TV, Unpolished Mirror, VK, Valiant Shadow, Van the Cheese, and Vincent Liu, Vad M, Vukrulez, Wendigo, A Fear Worth Living. We seriously could have had a Bug Snacks review, but no, we had to get Planescape Torment instead. We were this close to greatness. Webgoth, Widukind, Wilhelm Schroederheim, William Riker, Witch Knight Ren, Walric, Zan, Extreme Steve, Yi. Yasserian, Yuki Cyan, Zachary Schulstad, Zane Brake, Zega Frega Omega, Ziklau, and Oscar Arneson for being a patron. Well, if you're not a part of the Discord, then I guess cat's out of the bag because of that other guy, but uh, yeah, the next video I have to make a uh, Planescape Torment video because that won a poll where one of the other options was the game Bug Snacks, but the people spoke and they really wanted Planescape Torment in place of Bug Snacks. Um, not my place to judge though, I put it up there knowing this was a possibility, but you know, I'm, I'm sure we're all a little disappointed and we're gonna have to move forward and just kind of put up with the next video. But uh, I do these polls every once in a while and if you want to participate in those, uh, check out the Discord. Anyway, I'll take up no more of your time with such matters. Hope you're having a great day, hope you're staying goth, hope you're staying gaming, and stay dehydrated drink lots and lots of dr pepper zero sugar develop liver problems later down the line that's for future you to, to, to worry about okay i'll see you guys later Bye bye there's a river of red it runs through you you gotta make this dead what's dead is new